everybody. Um, thank you for coming to our panel discussion tonight, uh, Turning the Tide on BC's Marine Pollution Crisis. Um, my name is Alicia Elgert, pronouns she, her. I am one of the ocean conservation campaigners at CPAWS BC, and I will be your moderator this evening. Um, at this time, before we begin our discussion, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded, traditional, and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations, who have been stewards of the land and waters encompassing so-called Vancouver since time immemorial. We acknowledge that we are uninvited guests on their territory tonight, and that we are incredibly grateful to be here. As you may already know, uh, this panel discussion is one of many events belonging to Precipice, changing the course of the extinction crisis in BC. Precipice is an art exhibition which tells stories of biodiversity loss and hope in British Columbia. Working with mixed mediums, seven BC-based artists will compel you to mourn, understand, and ultimately protect the lands and waters of Canada's most biodiverse province. I hope you had time to view the work in on your way to your chairs. If not, do not worry, you will have an opportunity to do that after our panel discussion here tonight, or you are welcome to come back another night or during another event during public hours. All right, so um, we're gonna begin now. Um, I'm gonna start with some introductions, so you know who I am, um, but no one knows who these fabulous people are yet. So, um, panelists, we have two microphones on the table in front of you. Feel free to pick them up and pass them around amongst you as suits you best. Um, so we're going to begin our introductions, and maybe we'll start with Calvin. I guess we'll start from that side, work our way <laughs> towards me. Um, yeah, I'm Calvin Sanborn. Uh, I'm a longtime environmental lawyer. Uh, I worked at West Coast Environmental Law Association uh, the, with the Commission on Resources and Environment, the Forest Practices Board, and for the last 20 years, I've had the joy of working with law students and environmental groups and First Nations and community groups on uh, projects to protect the environment. And uh, so I'm just delighted to be here. I will add, though, that I have left the Environmental Law Center, and so I'm not currently practicing as a lawyer, so anything I say, you should take with a, just a dose of salt. <laughs> and uh, I refer all real legal authoritative questions to Michael Bissonette, who was one of my students and is now a lawyer at West Coast Environmental Law. He knows it all. And hello, everyone. My name is Octavio Alonso Cruz Coto. Octavio is also fine if you don't speak Spanish. Um, I'm from Venezuela originally. I've been working with Pakwachan First Nation on Vancouver Island for I'm approaching my fourth year there now um, as a marine manager within their new marine program that was just started in 2020. I'm a marine ethnoecologist by trade, specifically focusing on traditional uses of shellfish, which will be a part of our discussions today. Good evening, everyone. I'm Rebecca David, Chief of Pakwachan First Nation, so it's good to be here. Uh, I work with these guys next to me here. <laughs> uh, I've been serving in the political realm for just about nine years now, and this is one of the projects we've been working on, is um, working on the Shellfish Initiative and trying to get the restoration, um, basically trying to get our beach open again, and it's been about 27 years, so that's been a long time coming in terms of um, trying to come up with solutions and being proactive on how to address um, shellfish closures in our community and it's been closed since 1997 so that's what we're here to talk about tonight thank you hi my name is lucas harris i'm the executive director for surfrider foundation canada uh, surfrider is an international organization that's dedicated to the protection and enjoyment of oceans waves and beaches and here in canada we have a fabulous network of community chapters and student clubs that are all volunteer driven that really focus on a lot of key issues that affect our coastal environment, one of them being plastic pollution, which I'll talk about tonight. Thanks for having me. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Lucero Gonzalez, and I work with the Georgia Strait Alliance, and I'm their biodiversity campaigner. I've been working with the Georgia Strait Alliance for about two years, and we're a local. Um, 
NGO and I personally work on issues of orca recovery, salmon recovery, habitat protection, and we do a lot of work around wastewater. So we're so-called poop group. <laughs> we do a lot of uh, work on poop issues and we're very proud of it. So I'm very happy to be here. I, a little bit about myself, I am a recent immigrant from Mexico. So I also speak Spanish. If anybody wants to talk to me in Spanish, I'm happy to. <laughs> so yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, all right, so I guess I'll dig in here with a little bit of a summary of what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, so the purpose of this evening is to discuss the different types of marine pollution, physical, biohazard, and chemical pollutants, and their impacts on water quality, traditional shellfish harvests, and the endangered southern resident killer whales. Um, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that there are other important um, sources of pollution in the waters off the coast of BC, such as noise and light pollution. However, these topics will not be discussed uh, in tonight's scope, uh, just due to time constraints. Uh, we could go on forever about all of the sources of pollution here. Um, all right, so uh, with that, let's begin with physical pollutants. So. Just as an overview for everyone here tonight, um, these are discarded items such as garbage, abandoned fishing nets and gear, microplastics, and expanded polystyrene, or as you may have heard, EPS um, as an abbreviation. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Lucas here. Uh, Lucas, um, could you start us off by giving us an overview of physical pollution across our coast and maybe of why it's of concern? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's a whole type of physical pollution that we could talk about, like creosote covered logs or metal, but I'm going to specifically talk about plastics this evening because there's a lot to unpack there. Um, when we talk about plastic pollution, um, I'm curious, what do people think about as some of the commonly found things that we might encounter on the shorelines of BC? Do people think that plastic bags are Pretty common by show of hands. What do you think is the most common? Plastic bags? It's okay bags? to raise your hands for this. Plastic you can bags? How about ignore my drinking straws, maybe? Yeah, I see some head nods. What a cigarette butts? Yeah, absolutely. Very common, especially in urban communities. In the back? Styrofoam, Styrofoam yeah. De de definitely once it gets broken down into microscopic fragments, too. Um, so these are all the things that we find. Um, but I think it's important to acknowledge that a lot of uh, people's sort of understanding and perspective of, of what we think is common on our shorelines is driven by a narrative that is influenced by a lot of factors. So I think uh, there's a lot of attention on things like consumable packaging, single-use plastic items, and absolutely, these, these are things that we find on our shorelines, especially in communities um, here like in Vancouver or Victoria. But in actuality, I think the reason why there's so much attention to these materials is they're part of a, a much bigger global narrative. Um, when, you, when you zoom out and you actually take a more holistic look at what we find across the province in BC, it's, it's not single-use plastic packaging. And so um, we've had an opportunity as an organization to spend time exploring um, the coast of the island, for instance, spending time doing remote shoreline cleanups. And when we're in these places that don't, there's not a, a huge amount of uh, population, we find things like abandoned uh, fishing gear, commercial gear, that type of material, expanded polystyrene. Um, there's very little consumable plastic packaging. And it's quite staggering, in fact, how little that we do find. Um, and it's not just surf rider anymore. So you might have heard of a, um, a cleanup initiative that the provincial government's funded over the last couple of years called the Clean Coast Clean Waters Initiative, $50 million spent on funding cleanups to occur all across the coast of BC, not just on Vancouver Island. And um, the results of that are, are really impressive. Over a thousand tons of debris has been gathered, like huge volumes. Um, but when you analyze the data coming back from it, it it's, it's mind blowing. So 75% is abandoned, lost, or derelict fishing gear. 23%, 22% is unclassified. Things like random metal or stuff that can't be identified anymore. 2% is beverage containers. And 1% is packaging items. Things that you and I would consume, you know, st stuff we would buy from the grocery store. 
And so we think about all the attention that we're spending regulating single-use plastics. So, you know, for instance, over the last 15 years, there's been over 80 different um, laws introduced across Canada at a municipal, provincial, or federal level that attack single-use plastics. So we're, we're doing this enormous amount of lift on regulating single-use plastics. But when you look at the data of what's being found on the shorelines, it's, it's not going to scratch the surface. And so, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a huge accomplishment. We can all be very proud that we're eliminating plastics in our day-to-day -day lives. But if we really want to start to address the plastics that's happening, that's really impacting our shores, we have to think um, more broadly. And we have to target these other more out-of-sight, out-of-mind um, types of materials. So that, I think, is a huge concern because... Um, politically, it's much different to deal with. So single-use plastics is something everybody in this room connects with. Even cigarette butts that you mentioned earlier. We all see them on the streets. We all know that they can flow through the storm system, out into the ocean, then back onto the beach. So politically, those are really easy, I think, for you know people to, for government decision makers to uh, approach because they know that people can relate to them. When we talk about EPS, I mean, how many people had never even heard about that term before tonight? Probably a lot of you. And so these are difficult for organizations like Surfrider to really um, approach because politically they're not as, I think, uh, they're not going to have as much traction. So that is a concern for us as we really start to peel back the layers of the onion, so to speak, of the plastic pollution sort of landscape in the province. We now are faced with bigger issues that are harder to deal with. So that's kind of the, the crossroads that we're, we're at. We've made huge strides with the single-use plastics, but by no means are we, are we past that. I think the good opportunity that we have in front of us, which we'll talk about tonight, um, with BC's coastal marine strategy now um, being created, there's an opportunity to focus in not just on prevention, but also cleanup. And because it would be both, both those dimensions are embedded in the strategy, there's more synergies and ability for regulators to really create, I think, solutions that are um, appropriate for the problem because government can be very fragmented you would have one organization or agency dealing with the cleanup while others doing pollution prevention but now a strategy can tie them together so i'm very hopeful um, uh, and, and aspirational that this will be in fact an opportunity for us to to deal with these harder to solve problems um, time will tell but it is definitely a, a positive crossroads we're at but yeah a lot of work to still do, but I think we're heading in the right direction. Thank you, Lucas. Um, yeah, I really like that you mentioned that at, like plastic packaging is really is probably f the first thing that we think of, but it's probably statistically like the least amount of debris that is found. Um, so education is a great component of that. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, so shifting away from physical pollution for a moment. Um, we are going to head over to the other side of the panel um, and we're going to discuss um, biohazard pollution. So again, just a little general synopsis here. So biohazard pollutants are pathogenic or harmful um, bacteria, parasites, algae or viruses um, that alter water quality that might pose a threat to humans or the well-being of other organisms. Um, one of the most well-known biohazards is E. coli, or essentially we all know where E. coli comes from, right? It's, it's poop. Um, so uh, Lucero um, mentioned that lovely term, and that's um, something that we're going to be talking about a little bit tonight um, as well. So um, we're going to head over to um, Chief Rebecca David. Um, so. Um, Pakachin First Nation uh, has not been able to participate in traditional shellfish harvests since 1997, as Coles Bay is subject to year-round permanent bans on bivalve shellfish harvesting, which is a result of E. coli contamination. Um, Chief Rebecca, would you be willing to share how your community has been affected by this 26 going on 27, as you mentioned, year-long ban on practicing what are your inherent treaty rights? Thank you. Um, just to share a little bit, in 1997, there was a, a I will we call it blanket closure. Um, DFO closed our bay due to contaminants in our community um, in the 
beach area and uh, we haven't been able to harvest or collect any um, shellfish for the last how many years and um, due to the blanket closure it's caused a lot of hardship in our community due to like um, results of our health um, just lack of access of to our shellfish also the transfer of knowledge working with our elders and being able to go on there and have that knowledge transfer that hasn't been taken place for the last 27 years because we've basically been closed out from our beach and we're not able to harvest and um, I think of members that over time when you mentioned treaty rights um, we're one of the Douglas Treaty Nations of 1852 so our Hunting and fishing is um, basically protected within our treaty rights, but that's been violated for the last 20, almost 27 years now, and not being able to access or harvest any of our um, shellfish in our community. And so it has caused hardship with our community members. Um, we have had some community members that have um, used to use it as livelihood to be able to go down there and either harvest for their own families or harvest for commercial. And that's something that economically has hit some of our members as well and not able to access the beach and so this is something that uh, when I became chief in 2014 um, we wanted to start figuring out how do we actually get access to our beach again how do we open it up so as a small nation it was hard to be able to have the capacity or the um, financing to be able to actually be able to get out and do testing and water sampling over the years and it was something that we had to work towards so as the years went by we ended up creating a marine legacy program and so that's when we start building up capacity and being able to do the water sampling and monitoring ourselves and starting to address what the real problems are in our bay and um, our marine program has done really well uh, we've done some knowledge transfer exchanges with a few other nations as well so we're building capacity and being able to work with other nations who are familiar with these kind of um, opening up the beaches and closures um, what's happened over the years so as we're moving forward, um, I would just say that um, I guess after 27 years and being able to come up with a solution and be proactive to work with the government and see where we can actually address some of these issues, um, you'll hear in the conversation from our other two sitting here um, that we also look to the Washington State for their model, um, what has worked for them for the last how many years. So it's something that it's... It's something within reach that we'll be able to actually achieve and be able to start actually opening up our beaches and create a model that will work for the rest of the province, like province-wide for some of these shellfish um, openings for other communities that have been closed. Um, I don't know, is that is that buzzing for me or is that just buzzing? <laughs> no, I think that might be the front door. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm like, oh. <laughs> um, it's your idea buzzer. Um, Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I actually, I had a thought when you were speaking just now. Um, I think, and there was actually an article that I believe you contributed to um, that I was reading recently. And um, I just wanted to maybe bring up the topic of reconciliation and um, what do we mean when we say reconciliation? And I think so many times people have this idea that it's like, some like politically correct land acknowledgement or something that is very surface level and is nice, but doesn't at the end ultimately result in a lot of change. Um, and I just think that it's incredibly important with what you're saying and passing down traditional generational knowledge, have, not having access to shellfish harvesting and to your, your territory, it, it breaks that up and it, it's a block um, to that as well. So um, I think supporting Indigenous sovereignty and autonomy and being able to pass down that knowledge is super important and this is like reconciliation in real life and actually healing. Um, and I think that's important to mention here tonight that that's, it's really important for that reason. Thank you for that. Um, I know a lot of people use it as a buzzword at times for reconciliation, but it goes beyond um, just that conversation of reconciliation. Um, it's turning it into reconciliation and being able to be proactive on the ground and be able to move a lot of these initiatives. And it takes a while to get the government to hear you, but I do believe we have their ear now. So it is moving in the right direction. And um, that's all I can say is we didn't think it was going to take this many years of the closure. But now that we're actually getting people on the ground to do the testing and monitoring, we're able to kind of inform our own people whether it's really closed, if there's contaminants, or if it's just another blanket closure because there was no testing or no funding in the past time to actually do the monitoring. Absolutely. So. Um, Octavio, I might come over to you next. Um, so 
my question for you is um, if you're able to describe um, the reasons why Coles Bay has been contaminated with E. coli in the first place and um, what environmental impacts are associated with that exactly? Sure. Um, so Coles Bay is pretty typical to a lot of other urban communities and rural communities within British Columbia. Um, there's a lot of aging infrastructure. There's a lot of various components at play. Um, Pocketrons Reservation sits on the southern end of the bay. On the north end, we have a municipality. On the ocean side, we have a mishmash of red tape coming from federal government, from provincial government, who's managing what. Um, and E. coli, or um, sewage, basically, we can use it as a proxy for sewage. It's just a natural occurring gut bacteria. We all have E. coli within ourselves, same with every other mammal and animal that is sitting there and digesting and excreting wastes into our storm drains or wastewaters or streams. Where it becomes a challenge is where it starts to show up disproportionately. Um, it introduces a lot of nutrient yields into the environment. You can see things like increases in, in algae blooms. You can see fish die-offs, um, depletion of oxygen levels, and then you also have the, the impact on humans whenever you have large amounts of E. coli or fecal coliform, which is another type of gut bacteria you see you get very direct human health impacts. Um, I'm sure everyone's, well, not everyone, but if you've ever gone traveling and you drink the water, or eat the ice cubes, and you get issues with your stomach immediately afterwards, that is most likely E. coli contamination that has caused the problems you're, you're facing. Um, so that's exactly what happened with Pakwachin. Pakwachin has a municipality on the North Shore outside of the reserve. Pakwachin as a community itself is actually all sewered in into hardline sewer where there is no septic fields or potentials of leaking on the reserve side. But what we see is on the North Shore we have a series of multi-million dollar homes that were built um, on a rocky outcrop peninsula, which is pretty common to BC's coasts. We have these amazing rocky intertidal shorelines, but they're not exactly great when you decide to put in septic fields beside them as opposed to sewered in lines that go to a treatment plant, for example. So Pakwachin has been closed and the community didn't know this. That's also something to stress. Um, and usually in general with DFO, it is really hard to find out why these closures are put in place for harvesting. But the contaminants were just labeled by DFO as being contaminated. There was no explanation. It wasn't until we started our program that we figured out it was fecal coliform and E. coli, and it's specifically coming from the development of those septic fields that um, were basically never supposed to be built in the first place. Thank you. That's a lot of information, <laughs> and it's, it's great to hear, though. Um, thank you for that. Um, so while we're still talking about uh, Pakistan territory around Coles Bay, um, just also I recognize that I, I didn't give you a clear geographical pinpoint of where that is. Um, so it's around the Saanich Inlet, so like just outside of Victoria, and please feel free to correct me if I am wrong or could give a better description. <laughs> um, great. <laughs> um, so that is where we're talking about. Um, so while we're still talking about this topic, um, I'm going to turn our focus actually a little bit to the impacts of chemical pollution on the coast um, and hoping that maybe Calvin can chime in here a little bit. Um, so just another overview, um, chemical pollutants refers to any sort of agricultural runoff, pesticides, flame retardants, um, and chemical compounds known as forever chemicals, such as PFAs or PCBs, which receive their name because they don't break down easily in the environment. Um, so Calvin. Can I talk about Pakwachin first? Yes, Just you can. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, okay. Absolutely. This, this is my passion, is shellfish and restoring uh, the shellfish. So th the reason why Coles Bay is shut down to the Paquichin is because we haven't had a coastal marine strategy. And so what happened was that it, there's fragmented jurisdiction over the septic, which is regulated by the province and the local governments, and the ocean, which is regulated by the federal government, and if anything goes wrong, they just point fingers at each other. So we did three reports on this, and uh, one report points out that in 1996, about the time that Coles Bay got shut down, the federal government, so we did a, 
a submission about the problem with the silo of the federal government. In 1996, the federal government used to identify the pollution of shellfish and try to remediate the beaches. The federal government just resiled from that. They just stopped doing it. And they said to nations, if you want this to be monitored regularly, you'll have to pay for it, and we'll only monitor commercial exported shellfish. So that's one silo. And then we did a report on North Saanich, the local government, and we found that they had okayed the subdivision that uh, Octavia was talking about on the rocky outcropping, even though they'd been told it was inappropriate for a subdivision of septic systems to be put in there. And, and North Saanich also has uh, broken a number of promises, like in about 2000, they promised they would bring in a, a septic uh, regulation bylaw, which they never did. And when they were audited by the Capital Regional District 20 years later, they said, did we make a commitment? So we've heard that before. Um, and then the provincial government, the report that we did there, talks about how the province of British Columbia has failed to do what, what Washington State did, was Washington State recognized the tribal rights, the rights to fish in similar treaties to the Douglas Treaties, and, uh, and they implemented a healthy shellfish initiative. So in Washington State, if a bay gets closed, like Coles Bay got closed in 1997, you don't wait 30 years to act on it. By law in Washington State, they have to act in six months. And so we're saying that we need that sort of law. Um, the, uh, the difference between Washington State and British Columbia is that the EPA recently did a study looking at uh, Puget Sound in Washington State and the Straits of Juan de Fuca in British Columbia. They found that in, in Puget Sound, they'd set a goal of restoring shellfish beds and using First Nations to do the monitoring and to do the cleanup, and they, they found that 7,000 acres have been re, reopened in Washington State. They set a goal of 11,000. They didn't get there, but they got two-thirds of the way there, and the EPA said, in British Columbia, the situation continues to deteriorate. So that's, that's the reason why uh, we have this problem, and it has impacts on the Paquachin, it has impacts on the food budgets so the people that live in the Paquachin Reserve. It has impacts on the grandparents that no longer get to take their kids down and teach them the traditional ways with the shellfish. It has impacts on the community that can no longer have the clam bakes they used to have. So uh, we made recommendations in these reports that we set a goal to restore the 2,600 kilometers of BC coast that's shut down for sanitary pollution uh, by 2027, that they should recover and reopen 80% of those beaches. They should require action within six months, not 30 years. We, we ask that these initiatives be led by First Nations and that the federal government stop charging First Nations to do monitoring. They should do their job because they haven't, for several years, the federal government didn't monitor at all because they didn't recognize the, the uh, importance of shellfish to indigenous people. And uh, you want to say something here? Yeah. yeah. I'll just tie in something really quick, especially with the other contaminants listed. So we're specifically talking about stormwater and wastewater inputs and lack of regulation on it. That's really what comes down to the, the crux of the issue. Um, in our case, it was E. coli. But when you also look at sanitary closures for shellfish, which shellfish are an excellent canary in the coal mine in terms of what is actually happening in the marine environment. They're filter feeders. Whenever there's any sort of pollution, regardless of what it is, it will show up in shellfish pretty much first. Um, and then you will see it proliferate through the rest of the environment. And that does tend to follow areas where infrastructure isn't necessarily updated as much or where there's maybe barriers to infrastructure upgrades like you end up seeing on First Nation reserve land. Um, and that's directly coming from Canadian policy. 
Um, and we did an, I did a very, very initial review, and it depends on how you do the math. But the way you look at it, these sanitary closures, these blanket closures that affect Pakwachen don't only affect us, but pretty much every nation on the coast, if you are within one kilometer of coastline, you have about a 30% chance that the beach in front of your reserve is permanently closed. Be that from E. coli, like our case, or um, other chemical contaminants. We had Malahat First Nation just across the way from us. Their beach is permanently closed because they had a gravel truck run off of a road, launch into the air, 120 feet, land in the ocean. Um, the driver made it out okay, but it released about the entire tank's worth of diesel into that beach, which now they're facing a permanent shellfish closure because of diesel inputs. But it's all coming from the same regulatory problems that we don't necessarily have a way to identify and mitigate pollution sources that are coming from land. We're seeing jurisdictional differences from land-based sources to the marine environment. And that's a great example because even just to respond to that oil spill, Coast Guard deferred to the Ministry of Transportation because it was a vehicle. They didn't want to show up on site because it was a truck. Ministry of Transportation said, we don't have any boats. We can't go respond to your oil spill. <laughs> And nobody responded. The only people who responded were our nation, Malahat First Nation, because we managed to have just enough boom to hold it off until they could get there and clean up the beach. But by then, the shellfish beach it had landed on was already impacted. So that kind of, I'm just trying to tie it yeah, back yeah. to what our speaker was talking about yeah, yeah. <laughs> with other pollution <laughs> sources. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Um, that was, I'm glad uh, that you guys had a bit of a ramble. Um, that was really good information. Thank you, Calvin, and thank you, Octavio. Um, also, just a reminder, um, maybe to speak directly into the mics, everyone. I know it's a little bit weird to talk down, but um, just so everyone can hear the fantastic knowledge that you're all sharing here tonight. Um, all right. So, Calvin, I'm going to come back to you, actually. Um, so, we were, we kind of left off at, like, some fl uh, flame retardants and PCBs, PFAs. Um, I'm just curious if um, you could speak to the impacts of those pollutants around Coles Bay or in any of your reports for about a minute. Um, Hatcha, you, you were nodding. You want to talk to that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of secondary contaminants, um, we've done a good amount of testing. We looked at specifically for shellfish, but again, that impacts everything else. We do have salmon that run through Coles Bay. We do have a large amount of ground fish. We have shorebirds and an incredible environment. There's um, orcas that go through there every once in a while. We have porpoises. So it, it really ties into everything. But in terms of that specific area, we looked at 97 different pesticides coming through the stormwater system. All of them came back with a non-detect, which means there is nothing there. Um, we did look at heavy metal contaminants as well within the, sh the shellfish tissues. There were 53 different metals tested. Out of those, there we only had two samples come back for arsenic that were just slightly above the, the harvestable limit consumption limit that they recommend for seafood. But that's the same as with pretty much every other seafood. So as far as we can tell, in terms of contaminants that are actually impacting the clams, which will get you sick if you eat them, um, we don't really have proof from either the government's data set or from what we've tested ourselves that the shellfish there are not healthy to eat. Because the government, when they're testing for shellfish closures, they don't actually test the shellfish themselves. They don't look at the tissues or the gut content. Um, they grab a water sample. And if that water sample is above their 43 parts per million limit, um, the beach gets closed. And that is pretty much how we operate in, in British Columbia. So in terms of other contaminants from the ones that we've tested, we have not seen any major ones. However, if we were to look at Vancouver, for example, we have major stormwater drainages from a, from a city this large that are incredibly hard to contain. Um, and compared to Washington State, where they do regulate and fine municipalities if their stormwaters exceed certain contaminant limits, we don't necessarily do that in British Columbia which leads to these permanent closures pretty much existing around all of Vancouver. Yeah, so uh, in Washington State, they've measured the amount of toxic contaminants uh, going into Puget Sound, and more than half of it comes from uh, runoff, from stormwater runoff. So the way it works is that uh, oil, gas, solvents, uh, lead paint chips, uh, pesticides, they're all on the landscape. And if your landscape is highly impermeable, if there's a lot of paving and sidewalks, that flows directly into streams and then eventually into the ocean. So in Puget Sound, 
they measured uh, every 24 months there's the equivalent of an Exxon Valdez spill that goes into Puget Sound just from stormwater. 100,000 pounds of toxic contaminated material a day going in just from stormwater. And so British Columbia, as part of a coastal marine strategy, needs to ensure that they reinvent rainwater management, as we uh, did in a report from the ELC. We talk about uh, the reform that's needed there, which is to regulate stormwater um, by uh, enhancing green infrastructure, regulating pollution sources like auto body shops and uh, dry cleaners and so forth, requiring local governments to do integrated watershed management plans, and regulating agricultural runoff, which brings in chemicals as well as E. coli. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Calvin and Octavio, for speaking a little bit about that. Um, and I know we've been talking about small invertebrates like shellfish. Um, but shellfish are not the only uh, species that are impacted by pollution on the coast. Um, Lucero, could you share how marine pollution may impact larger species, um, such as our endangered southern resident orcas or other marine life? For sure. First of all, I feel like I want to keep talking about shellfish. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned so much uh, from all of you talking about that, and it's just fascinating, and I just want to keep <laughs> digging into it. So thank you, the three of you, for bringing that knowledge into this conversation. Uh, who likes Southern Russian orcas, or orcas in general? Yeah, I'm just gonna start by having like a point, painting you a general view of Southern Russian orcas specifically. Southern Russian orcas are a subpopulation or population of orcas, Orsinus orcas, that live in the Pacific Northwest, specifically around the waters of the Salish Sea, and they come into the, these waters mostly on the summer months, but we do see them year round um, more frequently now. They are an endangered species, and there are only 73 individuals in the population, 73 plus two calves that we don't count until they're more than a year old. So they are a very small population and killer whales in general are the most contaminated marine mammal in the entire world. And this is because they are at the top of the food chain and contaminants that are fat soluble, so not water soluble, they biomagnific, biomagnific, Biomagnify, biomagnify <laughs> uh, bio bio uh, through the food chain, food chain. So that means that it gets passed on from you know the tiny plankton that feeds off algae and all of that, all the way onto the top predators, which are orcas, southern Brazilian orcas, transient orcas, and um, orcas in general. And because of this, they are swimming, first of all, they're swimming, the Salish Sea, because of all the industrialization and all the problems that they've been talking about, it's basically a pool of contaminants. And these animals are swimming through a pool of contaminants, and not only that, but they are ingesting them. And not only that, but because they are fat soluble, it is incredibly hard to get rid of them. So you cannot get rid of them through like normal metabolic means. And this is when one of the biggest problems of southern resting orcas being contaminated comes in because as an adult, um, if you have a healthy adult killer whale, most likely they are not going to dig into these reserve or fat of fat when where the contaminants are stored until they don't have enough food to eat. And when the, the, they don't have enough food to eat, which is what is happening to the endangered southern resting orcas, they have three different threats. So it's um, food, food availability, so the lack of salmon in their habitat. They are um, acoustic, acoustic disturbances from ships and whatnot, and then the toxic contamination. And so when they don't have enough to eat, which is what's happening to this population, they are starting to dig into those reserves of fat, which contain a lot of, tox uh, of toxins. Um, some of these toxins are, like Alicia said, 
DDTs, PVCs, and all of these forever chemicals that we call them, but we're also seeing a lot of cons uh, contaminants of emerging concern, which are contaminants that have been maybe like introduced into the environment not so long ago and that we're still learning a lot about. Um, important to know that a lot of the contaminants that are affecting Southern Resident Orcas have been banned from Canada and from the U.S. since the 1970s, and we still seeing them in these waters and in Southern Resident Orcas. But a little bit back on how Southern Resident Orcas and orcas in general and marine and mammals in general, we how can we um, get rid of these contaminants is through process like lactation, through when um, contaminants can get passed to baby calves inside the mom's stomach. So even before an orca is born, it's already having a lot of contaminants going into their body, which is extremely concerning because as we know, we're not gonna recover an endangered population if we are not having healthy calves. And I don't know how many of you heard of Tahlequah, the orca that carried, <laughs> it always makes me a bit um, sad when I tell this story, but the orca that carried her dead newborn calf for 17 days straight in the waters of the Selish Sea. And that story is so important in so many ways, but I think specifically when we're talking with con about contaminants, we're never really going to know what happened to the calf. We're never really going to know what was the reason for uh, their death. But what we know is that we're not giving these calves a chance. If they're getting contaminants into their bodies even before they are born, because that's the only way moms have from the releasing that contaminants and they can't control it, obviously. We're not giving these calves a chance. And I think that's something that we really need to um, think about because we're not gonna recover this population if we're not giving those calves a chance. Um, yeah, and I think I just wanted to go back to the stormwater. And again, like as with so shellfish and orcas, they, a lot of the contaminants get into the water because of storm runoff and also because of wastewater systems that are not um, advanced enough to filtrate a lot of these contaminants. So the way it works in Metro Vancouver is we have what is called a combined sewage system in a lot of the infrastructure and how this works is that there can be a pipe that carries stormwater directly out to the environment and there's a pipe that carries um, house waste and like industrial waste directly into um, wastewater treatment plants. But in a combined system, they, are, they both connect and into one pipe that carries both of them into wastewaters. What happens is that in Vancouver, it rains a lot. So when it rains and when we have a lot of influx of uh, rainwater, these pipes overflow. So what happens is that when they overflow, all of that household contam contaminants and all of that household waste and rainwater go straight to the environment. So we're not filtrating anything that we do in our houses when it rains a lot and when there's a lot of overflows, it's not getting treated. So it's get going directly into the environment part of it. And even if it does get treated, even if we do separate, because we are seeing a lot of separation of sewage system in, in the Metro Vancouver area, Metro Vancouver still has primary treatment plants. Uh, the Iona Wiswire treatment plant is a primary treatment plant, is the biggest one in Metro Vancouver, and it's just still treating primary treatment, which means that it's not filtering any of these harmful contaminants, and it's going straight to our waters. Um, so, you know, we can talk a lot about what we can do, point, point source control um, and updating these wastewater treatment plants, separating sewage systems and all of that. But the reality is that a lot of these contaminants are already in the environment and it's incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to take them out of there. And not only is it very difficult to take them out of there, but it will get worse with ocean acidification and it will get worse with climate change. And so there's a lot to say how we need to really act on this contaminant crisis immediately to ensure that future generations of orca and future generations of indigenous people don't have to deal as much with these contaminants because that's the other thing with contaminants and southern resident orcas is that like they've said, it's not only an issue 
on the fauna. It's not only an issue on the water, it's a human issue because Something that humans in Southern Brazil and Orca share is that we love the same food, and especially indigenous people rely on the same food that Southern Brazil and Orcas rely on, which is mostly Chinook salmon and other types of um, wild Pacific salmon. And for coastal First Nations, they are eating the same amount of contaminated salmon that the Southern, or Southern Brazil and Orcas are eating. So there's a lot to say about that. Um, and I just wanted to leave you maybe with some actions that you can all take to make sure that we're putting our part in these contamination cri crisis, especially in the toxic contamination crisis. Uh, Georgia Story Line has a toxic smart guide that we left some pamphlets over there. Um, you can scan it and you can learn how to do some of your own DIY cleaning products that you can use. Uh, knowing about the sewage system, the overflow sewage system is very important because now when it rains, you know that if your area has a combined sewage system, maybe you shouldn't be cleaning your house with like <laughs> very harmful contaminants because most likely that's gonna go right into the environment. Don't wash your cars on your carport. Go to a designated area where you know that uh, it's not going into stormwater sewage, uh, but it's gonna be treated. Uh, and we all can have like very small actions that we can take to not only take care of Southern Resident Orcas, Pacific Salmon and Shellfish, but of the communities that truly depend on them that are the first um, coastal First Nations. Thank you, Lucero. Um, I love that you highlighted the intersectional lens of all these topics. Um, really what impacts one is gonna impact all eventually, um, sooner or later. Um, and I think that's a perfect lead into discussing coastal marine strategy a little bit um, because, uh, yeah, intersectionality is key. Um, so the spark for this panel was to create a space to discuss issues um, that a BC coastal marine strategy and law may address. Um, so you might have heard Calvin mention coastal marine strategy. Um, so for those of you who have never heard of it, um, right now, the province is working with coastal indigenous nations to develop a coastal marine strategy that will be a comprehensive provincial plan to better protect and manage the coast. Um, this strategy is currently under development and will begin implementation next year in 2024. Um, and last month, um, the government of BC released a What We Heard report, which summarized public feedback submissions on the Coastal Marine Strategy Policy Intentions paper. Um, marine pollution was the third most frequently mentioned item within the What We Heard report. Respondents' concerns span a range of pollution types and sources, including ghost fishing gear, stormwater pollution, sewage discharge, and aquaculture waste. Concerns about pollution from vessels, including the risk of oil spills, fuel leaks, and sewage discharge recurred frequently. Plastics and polystyrene were also top of mind among respondents, many of whom indicated concerns about deteriorating styrofoam and expanded polystyrene docks. Um, so in general, respondents expressed a strong desire to see stronger laws on marine pollution, as well as increased and more effective pollution monitoring and enforcement under the coastal marine strategy. Um, so either I might go back to Calvin or whoever is um, on the floor that has some thoughts about this. Um, how would legislation or legal reforms associated with the forthcoming coastal marine strategy be able to address some of the issues that we've discussed here tonight. Um, I think there's a lot of mention of silos and jurisdictions. So Calvin, if you want to give us so a brief. So if we just go back to what you were, we go back to what you were saying about the orcas and the PCBs that come from the stormwater. The problem is that everybody's in silos and a coastal marine strategy law could require them to get out of those silos. So you have to, regulate stormwater, and that's being done in some places in Victoria and Vancouver, fairly progressive, but other places not at all. So a Coastal Marine Strategy Act would require that everybody act together, that all local governments act and regulate their stormwater. And uh, in, in the non-toxic sphere, we've seen how the uh, Coastal Marine Strategy and the Shoreline Protection Act in Washington State has dealt with the problem 
of uh, riprap and uh, the riprap along shores that people are putting in to stop erosion uh, is destroying the spawning fish that feed the salmon, that feed the orcas. And so to save the orcas in Washington state, they, they use their statewide sort of strategy law to require that every community in Washington state uh, regulate those riprap's that, that are uh, actually a huge threat to the orcas. And uh, so, so that's what we need is this overarching provincial uh, thing of, of setting a goal that all governments, federal, provincial, local, First Nations, that they, they all are acting to protect things like the orcas. Yeah, I think, I think that's definitely necessary, but I think for me the first step for the province specifically, and specifically around marine issues, they need to take responsibility because they're not taking responsibility. Every time you talk to them about orcas, every time you talk to them about salmon, every time you talk to them about something that is not directly under jurisdiction, they don't take responsibility. And it's, it's you know, they pass the ball to whoever they think it's going to grab the ball. But the reality is that no, no one is grabbing the ball. And so these issues do become... Um, like worse because nobody's taking responsibility. And I, I was very hopeful with the coastal marine strategy that they would start taking responsibility. And I was very happy that they were mentioning Southern Red Sea Orcas and Salmon in their intentions paper and um, in their coastal marine strategy. But then the reality is that when I was talking to them, they kept not taking responsibility for these very important issues. And they are leaving it, especially around wastewater and stormwater, they're really leaving it up to municipalities that already have way too much on their plates and that they don't have enough money to do these type of things. And municipalities are trying, well, a lot of them are trying to do good work on them, but there's not enough money. And wastewater is one of the most expensive types of infrastructure to, to deal with. Um, in Metro Vancouver, and I mean, I, I'm not an expert around the world, but <laughs> but in Metro Vancouver, it's very expensive. So uh, the Iona Wastewater Treatment Plant, we fought a lot to for it to have tertiary treatment in their upcoming um, upda upgrade of the plant, and it was not until the province stepped up and it gave. Metro Vancouver, like $200 million or something like that to upgrade the plan that we actually saw Metro Vancouver being like, okay, yeah, we can have tertiary treatment in the biggest, <laughs> one of the biggest cities of, of North America. So I, I really do feel like it, it all comes down to responsibility and supporting municipalities to do this work because, um, yeah, and breaking the silos, like you said, it's very important and trying to work together even through um, jurisdictional and like all of those kind of things, but it is, it is very frustrating, I think. Yeah. Sure. Um, I'll s two things very quickly. I agree. Responsibility from the province is major and is going to be something that everyone will have their part to play in terms of seeing how it is implemented in terms of the coastal marine strategy. Because of what we've seen so far is a lot of theory and a lot of really great application of new concepts within the coastal marine strategy. But where I am finding, and especially in, in, in direct discussions with coastal marine strategy staff, um, what they are looking for now is detail. They are struggling to connect the dots of, well, we have all these ideas that we want to move through environmental protections. We want wastewater management. We want reconciliatory actions with nations that tie into those things. But there's a, a pause, and that pause is how. Um, and that is, we've addressed it, and I'll, I'll use us as an example with Pocketon, because we specifically created these three reports on shellfish um, at the municipal, provincial, and federal level to specifically avoid the ball being passed back and forth between the government. We laid out the legal responsibilities of shellfish for the municipality adjacent to us, what the province needed to do, and what the feds needed to do, word for word, according to their own laws, to regulate shellfish accordingly. 
um, based on Washington State's model. And when we submitted these reports, it just happened to coincide with basically the end of the like development of the coastal marine strategy like framework. And they were just starting to look for examples of something that could potentially be included as a direct actionable item within the coastal marine strategy. And what we advocate for in here is essentially an implementation of the same shellfish management strategy that they have in Washington where you have increased sampling that is done by communities, by nations, by nonprofits within the sector, by everyone, collaboratively with the state in order to have an increased sampling protocol, more clarity on where pollution is coming from, and specifically tracing pollution to its source so it can be fixed. And when they saw that, <laughs> we had a really good response because that's what they're looking for. They need solutions on the ground. Um, and then you do also have to be very willing to take them to task for when they are not um, actually moving on these items. But I just wanted to also like share within Washington, so just an example. If this strategy is done properly, the Department of Ecology does something very similar to the coastal marine strategy. I can't remember the exact name of it. Um, but for stormwater specifically, I alluded to the fact that they basically mandated that municipalities have to follow a set level of rules, which is not how it works here. We, I, I had a legal summary created of pretty much every municipality on Vancouver Island from Nanaimo to Victoria, and every single one has a different idea of how stormwater should be managed. Unlike Washington, where they said, basically, here's the set levels of pollutants that you are allowed to have at the minimum levels in order for people to still enjoy the environment. And this came from the Department of Ecology. It didn't come from somebody with commercial interests or somebody with, you know, <laughs> other uh, bent, like, they didn't set the rules wanting increased money. They specifically wanted ecological integrity within the state. And if any municipality steps outside of that in Washington, there's teeth to their regulations. They're fined. And they have to pay a fine every time those samples are above the threshold limits that they've set for these wide variety of pollutions. Um, a very similar thing could be done, which is why I think a lot of us are talking about the coastal marine strategy right now, and why we're hopeful that even just a small section of it, especially related to stormwater, could have pretty wide-ranging effects in terms of getting everybody in the same page. Awesome. Lucas, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, there's like a, some really cool synergies going on here. Um, so the responsibility thing is huge. Absolutely. And they know that. So we're talking about the coastal marine strategy, and government knows they have a responsibility to do something. They're the last jurisdiction to do like a, a province-wide strategy. And, um, but it means they have to take some actions. The challenge with government is they don't know what those actions are. And so right now is this like pivotal time where they're really reaching out to NGOs around BC and asking like, what should we do, right? And it, it, at, one <laughs> at times you're like, uh, what? Don't you know what to do? Like you're the regulators here. The other times you're like, well, this is actually a really positive sign that they are willing to be collaborative and work with the people who are on the ground doing the research. And so, I mean, we've experienced this at Surfrider. Um, we talked about EPS. Um, by far, that is one of the worst types of st the plastic pollution that we find on the shores. It's these huge dock floats can break free from marine infrastructure and get pulverized in storms and just get fragmented into these tiny little white, you know, pellets almost. And impossible to clean up uh, we've known this for a long time and you know our surf rider volunteers in tofino work with the to look at first nations to create a program where they can retrofit docks replacing problematic eps with air-filled floats so we you know we are able to demonstrate like that something can be done that they can take steps to regulate something with alternatives so it's coming to the table with solutions like that you know, we have many, we're working on right, one right now with the Environmental Law Clinic on what are the regulatory options for dealing with cigarette butt pollution, because government knows it's a problem. When I talk to federal and provincial officials, they're like, uh, yeah, Lucas, we know, but we don't know what to do. And so it's an opportunity right now for us to go to the table with some research, be like, this is what we've been able to identify as the steps that we need to take to solve this problem. So we're lucky. We have like receptive regulators at the federal and provincial level and now there's an opportunity for us to like support that conversation with these resources like you guys have been talking about with regard to um you know sewage and then we've been talking about with 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 plastic and styrofoam so it's i think the message that i want to leave with you guys is that you know connect with your environmental organizations you know figure out what 
actions that they're putting forward and get involved with those and try to elevate those in your communities because that is what the the regulators need to to hear um so you know whether it's signing a letter to ban styrofoam at a federal level like we have right now on our website or there's other actions you can take with regard to uh, protecting southern resident orcas those are all steps that you can get involved with right now because the province is listening they just need to know what those actions are Thank you, Lucas, for uh, summarizing that up really eloquently. Um, Calvin, I might cut you off. You gave me license to do that, so I might exercise that right now at this moment. Um, but we're going to dive into a question and answer period right now. So um, before we dig into that, um, just a sincere thank you um, to all our panelists for sharing your knowledge your knowledge and your lived experiences tonight. Um, we really, really appreciate that. So maybe a quick round of applause for our panelists here. Okay, um, so question and answer period. Um, we have two mic stands on either side of us. Um, we will pop a mic onto the stand. Um, and um, feel free to come up and ask a question. Um, okay, are there any questions? Just raise your hand. Yes, all right, let me. I have a few questions, if that's allowed. Um, Thanks, everyone. Uh, okay, Lucas, I have a question for you specifically. Um, the I I totally agree and have like observed the um, fishing and, and vessel pollution, and that's like a major contributing factor. Uh, I'm wondering if you think that single-use plastics uh, that we're not seeing them as much as pollution because of regulations uh, and um, like initiatives to reduce it, or if that's a, a historical thing that has been ongoing? Um, this question. I do think that we're very lucky here in BC to have probably the best waste management system for plastic packaging in all of North America. Um, the EPR program or Extended Producer Responsibility Program for plastic packaging and paper, um, or the blue box, right, has very firm targets for industry to meet with regard to collection and processing and so it's it's now basically enabled industry and to invest in not just collection infrastructure but processing infrastructure as well so it's really elevated the amount of material that um, is diverted from landfill and also reducing the amount that can leak into the environment so comparatively speaking to other jurisdictions we have way less um, packaging waste getting into the environment. It still happens. People still litter. Stuff does leak from the waste management system. But yeah, comparatively speaking, it's much lower. So yeah. OK, thank you. Um, and Octavio, I am wondering if maybe I missed you saying it, but um, when doing the samples of the bivalves, um, were microplastics a consideration? Is that something that should the water quality improve um, be a concern for the quality of the clams? That's a great question. Um, we have not been able to review them for microplastics, mostly because we are doing all this sampling in-house at Pocquitin, literally out of a converted shipping container, which we've turned into a lab and we're very proud of. Um, but mostly we just, we just don't have the capacity to actually look at the gut contents of the clams when they're, when they're being sampled, which would be one of the main ways to do it. Or you can actually look at the tissues and muscles in there. Um, we don't have the analytical capacity to do that. Um, we do do beach cleanups on our own beach. We have removed an incredible amount of plastic off of the beach. That's basically our go-to activity when, uh, you know, the weather's bad and the boats aren't good and we can't go out and do the sampling because the tides are bad. But in terms of the contaminants we tested, we were looking for things that would have an immediate health impact, which is why we tend to focus on pesticides and metals. And those are also great proxies for what's happening in the environment. 
So if we saw, for instance, a certain increase in pesticides, we are near a bunch of agricultural sites. So we were really interested in seeing whether we were getting runoff from the farms. And that was one way to get a proxy as to like, do we suspect this is coming from the farmland there? Um, but we didn't see any pesticides. And we also did E. coli source tracing, which is where I, I talked about everybody has E. coli. Um, you can tell the type of E. coli that you see according to the species, and we didn't really see a large signal for agriculture. But um, that's pretty much what we've done uh, in-house, and that's not funded by the province. We just did that ourselves. So microplastics have not come up on the list just yet. Okay. Um, and for both of you, is there anything that um, the scientific community or members of the scientific community or just members of the population as a whole can do to uh, support the Pakachin community? Yeah, lots. Um, we do have on our website the three reports we've been talking about here. Um, we can specifically look at the ministers involved or the um, government officials that are involved at each level of the reports. If you want to send a letter of support to them, um, feel free to do so. I'll also be around to answer questions more directly after the chat if you guys want some immediate actions. <laughs> Uh, my name is Oriana. I'm with the Ocean Decade Collaborative Center. My question is for Lucas and maybe for Calvin. Um, Lucas, you mentioned a thousand tons of debris or more being washed up and, and cleaned from the Clean Coast Clean Waters Initiative, and about 75% of that being ghost gear or fishing related materials. I know that a large portion of that is from non domestic locations. I'm wondering if you could speak to maybe with with the blueprint for the coast um, i'm wondering if you can speak to any engagement that's happening internationally to help mitigate that from washing ashore um, yeah locally i guess yeah, that is definitely what i call the elephant on the beach like it's a huge issue people are starting to understand it but we do not know how to solve that problem because it is such a highly decentralized form of pollution you know I've been on these West Coast beaches and I've found pollution from like all across the Pacific region. And so it's super difficult to, to I think, identify what the opportunity is there. Regulating single use plastics is like a low hanging fruit. It's stuff we consume in our communities. It's for a short period of time. It's easy to deal with, comparatively speaking. Um, I feel that, you know, that definitely is an international issue that I think is getting glazed over. So right now the U UN is focusing on an international uh, global plastics treaty. Um, the third round of negotiations is happening in a month or two in Nairobi. And then the fourth round is actually happening here in Canada in April in Quebec. Um, and that's something Surfrider has been really focused on elevating abandoned lost and derelict fishing gear to the top of that conversation. Again, a lot of those negotiations have been focused on single use items because and many other countries around the world, single-use items are a huge issue. Um, again, though, we need to bring the conversation back to Canada, the U.S., and, and thinking about these other sources. And really, I think by bringing that up at the international level, we have an opportunity to think of creative policies that can span multilateral borders. Because we're not going to be able to address it here domestically. If we regulate, you know, like a cleanup or a waste prevention program for... Um, fishing gear here in BC, we would be able to address the stuff that is produced and maybe used here, but not all the stuff that's drifting in from across the Pacific. So again, we do have an opportunity with the Global Plastics Treaty to try to elevate that, and so Surfrider's doing our best to raise that voice, but hopefully other organizations will as well. Thank you. And Calvin, I'm wondering if you can speak to uh, the Coastal Marine Strategy and if there's any um, international uh, clout, I guess, if this goes into an act? Well, the, uh, the people administering the coastal marine strategy uh, would have a focus on the, the end environmental impact, and so they, they might make presentations that would go to an international body, but maybe more importantly, uh, the strategy could look at alternative ways of dealing with this, uh, this foreign uh, debris. And you might look at uh, incentive programs and programs to get people out collecting it, uh, which m may involve large amounts of money, and uh, that could either come from taxes or it could come from charges on, on the domestic fishing gear industry that they, they have to pay as part of their extended producer responsibility uh, to get that done. 
because we do need to get it done. I, I was uh, listening to uh, Terry Lynn Williams Davidson, who talked about walking on the beaches in Haida Gwaii, like thigh deep in plastic, most of it from uh, Japan and China. So it, it would certainly be a focus for, for discussion to uh, lobby for international action, but more importantly, it would be focusing on uh, not just the jurisdiction of an individual department, silo department of government, but a strategy that is focused on end impacts in the environment with specified goals, and, and that's really critical. We, we get too much general language. You know, you read the, the uh, discussion paper and, oh, it's all about healthy ecosystems and we, we all want a healthy ocean. Well, we want reconciliation that you can eat and, and we want um, a clean environment. So are you going to uh, reopen 80% of the indigenous shellfish beaches by 2027 or not? Something measurable. We've had enough performative stuff. Hi, uh, my name's Louise, and I guess I'm talking to you more as a, as a parent. Um, so I'm wondering, in ter when you're speaking about systems, uh, city systems and sewage systems and so on, if there is sort of an idea or an outreach to put city systems as part of um, educational planning in elementary school, uh, social studies, and so on. I think that uh, as a woman, I think it was many years before I understood why the tampon's not supposed to be flushed down the toilet. You know, you see the sign that says don't do it, but you don't understand all of the steps that take you from where you push a button and things disappear to where it goes out. Um, I took the time uh, a couple of weeks ago to talk to a fellow who was just emerging from a sewer pipe, uh, like not a sewer pipe, but you know, a, a manhole cover. And I said, wow, you know, I've never been down in one of those places and it looks really, it, it would be a really cool place to take a, 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 an elementary school for a field trip. And he said, yeah, that's totally possible. Wow, it would be really cool. We could get them to do this. We could get them to do that. And I was really thought, well, well that's a great idea. I mean, if you grow up understanding how the systems of your city work, uh, that would be really helpful. And I don't think that most of us get this education. Uh, we're hearing about it here, but you know, maybe we could have learned about it before. So I just want to throw that out there. I don't know if any of you have any ideas about that, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I do, <laughs> I understand. I didn't know anything about switch until I started working with the Georgia Strait Alliance, so quite a learning curve there. Um, and it, it is a very complex issue that comes with a lot of complex language, and like complex science and engineer that even I don't fully understand. And it's very important to make that digestible, but and more than digestible, I think, uh, making people understand, like you said, the importance of these issues. So when I'm working with Metro Vancouver, a lot of these issues, um, when they're changing regulations for wastewater treatment plants and when they are um, changing sewage pipes and when they are doing all of these things, it's they actually consult the public. So there's like public consultations that go on. But I, I tell Metro Vancouver and the city of Vancouver, I'm like, how are people supposed to comment on issues this complicated if you don't uh, like explain to them first what it means. Um, I have to read like a 50 page report uh, just to do one submission on, on these things, right? And so it is very important and I think uh, it's something that Jersey Line has been wanting to do a bit more, kind of like talking, again, poop issues with the general public. Um, we haven't gone into schools, but I think it would be very, um, very cool. When we were doing well, I wasn't because I was very young, but when Georgia Star Alliance was doing outreach for the Victoria switch plan to have tertiary treatment, they actually came up with a, um, like a poop 
Mr. Guy, Mr. Floaty, yes. <laughs> and that actually was apparently what brought people more interested in rallying and like asking Victoria to create a tertiary treatment plan and they managed. And so, yeah, I think when you make it fun, when you make it relatable, it's, um, it's pretty cool. And so I've made kind of like videos explaining this issue and um, tutorials on how people can make their own cleaners and all of that. And we've had good... Um, good responses from that but i think we sh definitely need to do more of that yeah. yeah i just okay thank you very much and i'm hoping that maybe this could be a a, curric a curriculum chapter at least anyway can add something really small to that also just a small story um i used to teach water quality that was what i taught at, at western washington university um, as one of the courses there and they had this great component where they actually teamed up with the local high school to go downtown. And as part of the course, these university students actually had to interface with these younger high schooler students. <laughs> and they got toured by like, it was like one passionate guy who worked at their um, treatment plant there for, for septic systems. And it, it was pretty cool. And he basically just led this really impassionate walk through the town of like, these are rain gardens that we built in whatever year. And these are the plants that we use to filter out the metals in there and the rubber from road runoff. And you shouldn't wash your car in the in the driveway and all of these things like that. And the university students actually got to impart that onto the high school students, everything they've learned throughout the year. Um, I don't know of an equivalent happening here. I can think of reasons why, a few being that if the municipality led those tours here, it would basically be like, here are the septic fields, and then it goes into the ocean. <laughs> and that doesn't make for a very good lesson, <laughs> um, but I do like the idea. Actually, uh, when we did the stormwater report, I discovered to my amazement that there are a lot of people like that that hang out in the storm sewers. And, and if <laughs> just Google uh, drains of my city, and you'll find all these pictures of people that explore the, uh, the storm sewers. And we put pictures in our report on, uh, on stormwater of the big tunnel to show the problem where it's a big tunnel and then there's a little pony wall between in the middle of the tunnel. One side is sanitary sewage and the other is stormwater. And of course, when it rains, it all gets mixed together as it runs over the pony wall. The pictures are there. Pictures worth a thousand words. Thank you. Um, I love the sentiments about education. Um, Lucero, like you, um, I actually like I didn't have the proper knowledge of like what's behind a sewage treatment plant or like what happens when we put things down the drain um, until I worked with a previous organization that dealt with water quality um, and E. coli. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely not a part of I feel like m our general education system, um, but I think that that could really help. It helped connect the dots for me, but I was a full grown adult. So um, <laughs> it would probably be helpful to have these uh, educational outlets for kids. Um, it's certainly easy, to un easy enough to understand once you get taught. Um, it's pretty, pretty simple. Um, awesome. So uh, we are at just about the 730 mark. Um, so we are going to end here at 7.30. Um, we are going to keep this space open for half an hour um, for you guys to have a little bite to eat, um, have a look at the gallery at the front by the front door, um, chat with any of us, say hi, ask a question that you didn't want to ask or just one that you've thought of. Um, there are a couple little mentions that I have before I say good night uh, from the microphone. Um, so bear with me as I get through some of these. Um, so these lovely chairs um, that we are sitting in tonight are uh, from a furniture shop across the road that was kind and generous enough to just lend them for us here tonight to use um, so we would be comfortable. So thank you to Design Modern uh, for providing the furniture that we're using on stage. Um, if you enjoyed tonight uh, and are eager to attend another panel discussion, um, you can join Tori Ball, who is our Terrestrial Conservation Manager at CPAWS BC on Thursday, September 21st, so this upcoming Thursday, um, here at Alternatives Gallery and Studio in the same place we are sitting right now. Um, this panel will bring together Indigenous leaders and conservation experts to look at how BC can achieve and go beyond the goal of protecting 30% of lands and waters by 2030. 
um, if you want to register. Um, there are some precipice posters, the big orange and purple ones around the room. Uh, there will be a QR code on there that you guys can scan and check out the other events and workshops happening this week. Um, and lastly, um, this wouldn't be a proper nonprofit event if we didn't have like a take action item at the end of it for you all. Um, so before you leave, if you learned something here today that you feel especially passionate about, um, whether it's coastal marine strategy or just comments on marine pollution, um, we have some postcards at the back of the room. If everyone wants to turn their heads and have a look at Carlo, who is waving a Blueprint for the Coast postcard up. Um, so Blueprint for the Coast um, is a collaborative campaign between CPAWS BC and West Coast Environmental Law to advocate for a coastal marine strategy in BC. Um, so that is what Blueprint for the Coast means, if you were curious as to what that is referring to. Um, so if you want to write a couple words down on those postcards and leave them here with us, we will collect them at the end of the, ni the night and we will send them to Nathan Cullen, who is the Minister of Water, Land and Resource Stewardship. Um, and also we have some great QR codes at the display board behind you all. Um, we, as Lucero mentioned, we have a QR code for Georgia Strait Alliance. Um, and we also, which Kate is holding up very high for you all to see. Um, and uh, we also have some QR codes for Blueprint for the Coast on that display board as well. Um, we do send out a bi-monthly e-newsletter if anyone is particularly keen on learning more about coastal marine strategy. Um, feel free to follow that prompt and sign up for that as well. Um, and Calvin has his reports up here, too, that I'm sure he would be keen to talk to you guys about as well. Um, all right. So um, I think with that, uh, I'm going to say good night to all of you officially. Um, so just one more round of applause for everyone here tonight. Thank you.